Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the first day of Miro Distributed. I'm joining you today live from Austin, Texas, one of Miro's many hubs around the world. My name is Paul Darcy. I joined Miro just over two years ago as the company's chief marketing officer. When I started at Miro in September of 2020, it was early in the pandemic. While I started collaborating with other Mirrorneers immediately, it was almost a year until I met my first coworker in person. The experience of these last two years of work, probably for all of us, has included deep highs and lows and an unusual warping of time where it often feels like the months are flying by and simultaneously endless. We've all changed in our own ways during the pandemic. While I did not get a pandemic pet like many people that I know, I did enthusiastically embrace houseplants, I started swimming for exercise, and I found myself side by side with my kids on so many more days when I was working and they were in school at home. During this time, everything about Miro has changed as well. We've grown from 7 million users to more than 45 million users, Today, we have more than 1,800 employees around the world innovating and serving our incredible community of users and clients. All of this personal and work growth has taken place within the context of a changing world. The world around us is starting to resemble the reality that we once knew. For example, we regularly see each other in person, routines feel familiar, we wear masks less often, and my houseplants now suffer from a dangerous lack of attention. Despite the semblance of similarity between today and our pre-pandemic past, there is no doubt that our world and feelings about it have evolved. The way we work has likewise undergone an incredible transformation. It's the combination of these two things, work and our feelings about it, that we'll be exploring together today in this session, the human side of the ways we work. To start, the experience and context of post-pandemic work is fundamentally different than what came before. When we look back to right before the pandemic, our research shows that the vast majority of knowledge workers, 72% of us, went to the office every single day. At that time, remote work was rare, with just 6% of us working fully remote and 22% working from home some of the time. The word hybrid, which we now use to describe this mix of in-office and remote work, was barely in our work vocabulary three years ago. Today, the distribution of knowledge workers across these three environments looks quite different. Unsurprisingly, those who work remotely make up a much larger proportion of the workforce, approximately one-third, than they did prior to the pandemic. With more people than ever working remotely, the experience of work has changed forever. There are fewer of us in conference rooms, and we spend more time as tiny faces in squares of virtual boxes than we ever thought possible. Here at Miro, we've always been interested in where people are choosing to work and how they are getting work done. And given the transformation that we are all living through, we were eager to research this more deeply. So we spent a few weeks between August and September of this year surveying more than 2,000 knowledge workers in order to more fully understand how their behavior, expectations, and priorities regarding work have evolved. Whether we work mostly alone or mostly with other people, knowledge work is about relationships. The structure of our days, the meaning in what we do, the joy and frustration of work, it's all intricately interconnected in this complex web of relationships. What Miro's research shows is that we can think about work as the intersection of three distinct levels of connection. The first is our relationship to work itself, the where of work. The second is our relationship to the people with whom we work, the us of work. And the final dimension is our relationship with ourselves as workers, what we call the me of work. By investigating the intersection of these three levels of connection, we can better understand work on a deeply human level and how to keep the meaning of work in mind as we build the future of work together. So let's dive into that first level of connection, our relationship with work itself. This starts with a few questions. How have the ways we work evolved? Where are we getting work done these days? And perhaps most importantly, 
how do we feel about all of the changes that we are experiencing? Prior to fielding this research, our team had a number of hypotheses about the insights it would unearth. As with almost any study, some of our predictions were validated, while others were completely overturned. So that you have the opportunity to share in this experience, you'll see a handful of questions throughout this session asking you to predict what our survey respondents shared with us. And this brings us to our first question for you. Are you, you are going to vote right in your hop-in screen. All that you need to do is hover over the notification in the top right-hand corner and select the Vote Now option. Okay, are you ready? Well, here it is. True or false, given the choice between remote, in-office, and hybrid, most knowledge workers say their preferred work environment is 100% remote. I'm excited to see your answers as they appear. I'm starting to see the votes come in. So do workers prefer to work in an office or in a hybrid environment? If so, your answer should be false. If you think knowledge workers prefer to work remotely over the other options, go ahead and answer true. Well, I can see the votes are strongly leaning towards false. Um, and so here are the actual survey findings. Our research revealed that over two-thirds of knowledge workers say that their ideal work environment includes some time in the office, with 56% preferring some version of hybrid and 12% wanting to be fully in the office for a total of 68%. So those of you who guessed false guessed very well. The remaining one-third of workers prefer to be fully remote. Now, this surprised us. We were fascinated to see that it was important for the vast majority of knowledge workers to spend time in a physical office environment. One of our hybrid survey respondents explained their perspective, saying, I believe that hybrid is the best of both worlds. It allows some separation between work and home life, enables coworkers to see each other and interact in person, and breaks up the monotony of constant virtual meetings. We posed some of these same questions to the Miro community, and one of our Miro heroes, Annie McLeod, added, for growing companies, hybrid is ideal to balance a space to do work while bringing connection through shared spaces and interactions. And yet knowledge workers' actions may tell a different story. Once we had the data, we were curious to look closely at the responses of the 700 knowledge workers who've been with their current employer for two years or less. So this group for us is really interesting because they changed jobs during the pandemic. And theoretically, they had the chance to choose employment while considering the working environment that best fits their preferences. So what did they pick? It turns out that most are either in office, 42% of people who joined a new job in the last two years, or remote, 37%, and that a much smaller number Roughly one in five or 21% are working in hybrid environments. So this data surprised us. It's interesting. And there could be a few reasons for this. The first possibility is that perhaps they didn't have the luxury to choose their next employer based on work environment. In this case, the data is probably not that useful. The second possibility is that their new company announced return to office plans after they started. But the third possibility, the one that is most interesting, is that work environment did factor into their decision and that they were aware of their new employer's policy and they chose a company that offers a fully remote or fully in-office option anyway. So here's what I'm very curious about. Why would people who say their ideal environment is hybrid not specifically pursue a company with a hybrid work policy? Well, it's a mystery. It could be because hybrid is still, in most organizations, a work in progress, and either unattractive or risky as workers choose their new work paradigm. As management professors Marion Lewis and Wendy Smith recently wrote in Fast Company, while we want the best of home and work, too often we end up with the worst of both. Middle of the road options are just splitting time between locations and rarely doing it well. The next thing that we learned is probably intuitive. 
One of the really big work changes of the last two years is this explosion of virtual meetings and communications. While some of this was by necessity, research from Gartner shows that 83% of HR leaders actively encourage teams to increase the number of meetings and virtual interactions to keep connected during the pandemic. In their words, the result of this practice of virtualizing office-centric design has exacerbated fatigue levels for employees. If there's one thing we all know, it's that the endless stream of video meetings can be completely exhausting. Now, our research bears this out as well. Over half of our survey respondents identified communication in its many varied forms, in person and virtual meetings, as well as email and instant messaging, to be the most draining part of their typical workday. Now, this is a change. Before the pandemic, the biggest strain on knowledge worker energy was, not surprisingly, commuting. That time we spend in cars, trains, buses, bikes, or walking to get to and from work each day. So here is an amazing fact about the world today. Even workers who go to the office every day find virtual meetings more draining than they find commuting. And for those of us who no longer commute every day, it seems that most of the time that has been regained from less frequent commutes has been completely lost in the form of greatly increased collaborative screen time. While leaders have tried to recreate the serendipity of water cooler moments with virtual meetings, employees have found their own way to stay connected. Today, knowledge workers, especially hybrid ones, rate collaborating closely on a specific project as the best way to build relationships with colleagues and managers. So that's an interesting thing. Over the last two years, the act of working together has become central to forging cross-functional connections. As you can see in the survey data here, this is especially true for hybrid workers. Based on the industry standard Utrecht work engagement scale, hybrid workers report being more engrossed in their work than their remote and on-site counterparts. Approximately half of workers regularly feel happy when they are working intensely or deeply immersed in their work. And this is most true for hybrid workers who are also more likely to get carried away when working. Now, while optimizing the experience of working together on projects in the right way is obviously a passion of ours here at Miro, people's hyper-focus on work can also cause burnout on the individual human level. As one of our survey respondents shared, the problems arise from the overwhelming pace of the job, and that's gotten worse. And I know a lot of us feel that that is worsening. So today, we're left grappling with this paradoxical problem that people seem to want hybrid work, but that hybrid work needs work. So this brings us to our second area of research. So here we're going to focus on our relationship with each other at work. In the first section, we saw that today's working models are a work in progress and far from ideal. In the second section, I'm pleased to share that there is good news when it comes to the evolution of the relationships between knowledge workers. In our survey, 40% of respondents said that they are unlikely to leave their job in the next year. For this group, the number one reason for staying is feeling connected to and not wanting to leave their team. It's not pay, it's not flexibility, it's not opportunity, although those are all important. It's the relationship with the people that they work with. As one remote worker explained, the people I work with are the key to making a good place to work. And this is something that I feel too. In my job at Miro, I am strongly connected to the people that I work with. My work relationships are rewarding and can bring a lot of joy. When we looked at the research results by generation, we saw something particularly interesting. It became clear that one particular cohort has been able to build strong webs of connections despite the distributed circumstances of recent years. Now you've probably guessed, it's time for you all to make another prediction. Simply hover over the hop-in notification and click vote now to weigh on this question. Uh, so here it is. Which generation of workers surveyed was most likely to report that their workplace relationships are better now 
than they were before the pandemic. Could it be baby boomers because they have the most workplace experience? Or maybe it's millennials or Gen X who are mid-career and have the chance to shape their environment. It's fascinating. I see the votes starting to come in. It looks like millennials are in the lead. Um, is it Gen Z who are newest to the workplace and may have a completely different way of working? I'm gonna give you a few more seconds to make your vote right in the hop-in console. I love that the votes are across the board on this. It looks like millennials are in the lead and then Gen Z and Gen X. And the final one is baby boomers with almost no votes. Okay, that looks final. Your survey says uh, millennials is by far in the lead. So what did our research show? What the research shows is that all four generations in the workforce, Gen Z is the most likely to say their relationships across the organization are better now than before the pandemic. About a quarter of you said that that was the case. In fact, half or nearly half of the Gen Z workers surveyed say they have stronger ties to company leaders and their direct managers today than before the pandemic. Our belief here is that although workers from this generation have the least work experience, they are, as digital natives, naturally adept at building connections in a virtual world. In fact, they're one of two generations to identify casually chatting via messaging apps as the best way to build and strengthen worst place relationships. Any guesses as to the other generation of workers that say the same? That's right, we've got a bonus question in this section. Okay, and so here it is. Any guesses as to the other generation of workers that says the same? So in case you're joining us late, um, you can use the um, hop in voting in the top right corner to cash your vote for the answer to the question. When it comes to workplace relationships, with which generation do you think Gen Z has most in common? Okay, so you've got three options to choose here. Millennials, Gen X, and baby boomers. I don't want to skew the results, but one of the options here seems particularly obvious. Too obvious, I wonder? Okay, let's see what you've said. Okay. So I see Millennials is in the lead here, Gen X is in second, and then Baby Boomers is the last. So this one actually caught us off guard. So we were surprised to see that the two bookend generations, Gen Z and Baby Boomers, have the most in common when it comes to what they expect from their workplace relationships, as well as from work itself. When answering the following questions, both Gen Z and Baby Boomers' top responses were exactly the same. To the question, what's the best way to develop connections with colleagues today, they were the only ones that answered casually chatting via messaging apps. When asked, why are you unlikely to leave your current employer in the next year? Gen Z and Baby Boomers said, I feel connected to and would not want to leave my team. And finally, in response to why has your relationship with your direct manager improved, both noted that they're motivated by managers who encourage their growth and give them new challenges to tackle. And finally, both generations identified relocation as the biggest deal breaker that would prevent them from accepting a dream job. To us, this indicates that Gen Z workers want to have control over where they build their lives, while baby boomers want to stay where they've already built them. For all of us, one of the most important work relationships is with our manager. And so we ask participants if their manager cares about them both on and off the job. And we were thrilled to see that these similarities extended across all of the generations. So, the majority of Gen Z, Millennials, Gen X, and Baby Boomers agree that their managers care about their professional development, work-life balance, 
emotional and mental well-being and also about them as a person. And that was really, really good for us to see. Now, this is also in line with what Gartner's research shows to be deeply important to workers. Their research revealed that 82% of employees agree it is important that their organization sees them as a person and not just as an employee. For all of us, it's important to be seen holistically and not just for the work that we do. Before we explore the last level of workplace connection, let's take a moment to reflect on what it is that we've learned so far. First, the majority of knowledge workers identify a hybrid environment with a mix of in-office and remote time as ideal. But the infrastructure that's currently in place to support this work arrangement is far from optimal. Second, in the face of fatigue and burnout, it's the social side of work. That is to say, our relationships with our colleagues, managers, and leaders that has the greatest potential to help keep people engaged and happy. This brings us to the third area of our research, our relationship to ourselves as workers. At the core of all of these interwoven work relationships is us as individuals. We're all different, each with unique professional goals and personal plans. For many of us, the following is true. As work has changed, we have changed. Today, we find ourselves collectively questioning what we want and need in a job, as well as what we want and need in our personal lives. So how can all of these puzzle pieces possibly fit together? In our survey, we can see that some of us are primarily motivated by making an impact, such as the respondent who wrote in that, working with others on a shared goal with impact on the larger world is a quality that they look for in a dream job. And some lack motivation or are overwhelmed by the troubles of the last few years, including the person who admitted, I do not want to do much of anything these days, unfortunately. As quiet quitting has shown us, this person is probably not alone. Still others see in-office or hybrid work as an assault on their freedom. They might only exchange the freedom of remote work for significant additional compensation. Says one respondent bluntly, I would need a 100% salary increase to go to the office more than twice a week. While everyone's desires and preferences are unique, there are commonalities among workers from diverse work environments and generations when it comes to the qualities that they expect in a dream job. And this brings us to our final survey question. So once again, hover over your hop-in notification and we will answer our last question together. And the question is this, what do you think are the two must-have qualities that knowledge workers say that they require. Okay, you've got lots of great options to choose from here, including compensation, flexibility, growth, positive team morale. All of these sound great to me, but what are the top two? Let's see what you think. It's interesting to see these votes start to come in. You can go right to the vote now in the top right half of your screen. Um, and so it looks like so far the winner is a company that offers remote work and respects my work boundaries. I see it's changing a little bit. Um, in last place is good growth opportunities and high salary. Okay, well, it looks like remote and respects my work-life boundaries is narrowly in the lead here. Here is what the research says. A high salary is number one, followed by flexible work hours. I think that was in third place, place in our voting. These qualities have remained the same from pre-pandemic through to today, indicating that knowledge workers consistently value self-determination and work-life balance. This remains true across changes in the macro environment, as well as different career and life stages. As Miro hero Michelle Murphy so compellingly puts it, I can be a human first and work can fit into my life versus my life fitting around work. I've been able to pursue side hustle passions while still being a great employee and teammate on top of my work. 
my house is always clean, my relationship with my family is great, and my work is thriving. Now, I must admit, Michelle's good fortune is making me feel a little self-conscious about my own life challenges, but that said, she is inspiring me to get my act together and to try to bring my houseplants back to life. We've talked a lot about us as workers today, but let's now look at the other side of the equation. What can companies do to ensure that people like Michelle continue to thrive at work and in their lives overall? We actually see lots of progress in this as organizations around the world make strides to design what Gartner describes as a human-centric workplace. They're doing this to reduce fatigue, improve performance, and to convince people to stay. Their efforts can be categorized under three distinct themes. Let's talk about the first theme, which is changing meeting culture. We've all heard of and or tried no meeting days. In fact, Miro's marketing team has no meeting Wednesdays, but inevitably quick sinks slip in under the impenetrable walls of those calendar blocks. The Leadership Circle, an organization that offers solutions to help leaders thrive and reinvent themselves and their companies, is taking a different approach. According to Betsy Leatherman, their global president of consulting services, instead of trying to ban all meetings on a particular day, some of their employees are testing a three meeting per day policy so that they have space for thinking and exercising creative muscles during the day. In another example, Tokyo-based multinational Lixel Group is pushing back on the cultural norm of long days and rigid work days. Lixels decided to eliminate core working hours and discourage morning meetings while also revisiting the experiential concept of what an office should be. Lixels chief people officer, Jin Montesano, summarized the changes in this way. The office is no longer the place to work. Wherever you get work done is where you work. What we wanna do is to reimagine the office as a place for communication, collaboration, brainstorming, reconnecting, and having an ability to have a deeper conversation that you just can't achieve online. Facilitating deeper conversation and connection brings us to the second way that companies are building a human-centric work culture. Some, like cloud service provider Lucidlink, are doing so with extreme transparency. Co-founder and CEO Peter Thompson explains this. He says, we try not to use email, we use Slack, and we try to encourage everyone to use public channels for everything. This makes everyone feel included and trusted. It's not just, hey, it's available, go look at it. Everyone is part of the discussion. So unless someone is coordinating lunch or there is a privacy issue around a particular topic, Lucidlink is transparent about even high stakes business conversations. Adds Thompson, People who join the company tell us they have never been in a place that is so open about some of the things that we talk about. Now, every company has its unique approach. For example, other organizations enable their employees to connect over shared interests. Helen Horseman Allen, the COO of Melbourne-based Fastmail, she suggests that companies have their employees incorporate detailed personal online profile files into their company intranet into like Slack workspaces or whatever forum they use to communicate cross-functionally. At Fastmail, she encourages employees to go beyond sharing a photo. She urges them to build a richer profile with personal details that can lead to better workplace connections and the discovery of shared interests. Horseman Allen offered a personal example. She said, I love to garden, so I posted a picture of my garden so people can ask, Helen, have you done any planting this season? Other people post pictures of their pets. Sometimes discovering shared interests like this can jumpstart workplace connection. In one of my favorite examples, Naomi Bagdonis and Connor Demon Dowman, their lecturers at Stanford's Graduate School of Business, they showcase the science of connecting via laughter. When we laugh, our brains release a cocktail of hormones. And when we laugh together, our brains are firing with the same hormones at the same time, cueing us to trust each other more and to make those two-dimensional interactions more memorable. 
Naomi adds, in this new world of work where we rarely see our colleagues in person or from the waist down, research reveals that humor is one of the most powerful forces an organization has for building genuine connection, well-being, and intellectual safety among our colleagues. Beyond leading with laughter, some companies are cultivating human-centric work models with a third approach, by listening to employees and partnering with them to co-create solutions to modern workplace challenges. For example, when London-based Brit Insurance set out to design and implement a new way of working at the beginning of the pandemic, they built an employee-centric co-creation process that included randomly selected employees that represented a wide range of roles and locations. They started working together by defining their own working capabilities and preferences, and then discussing how their diverse styles could successfully work together. After this wonderful start, uh, they broke into teams of six employees each and participated today together in a half-day hackathon to brainstorm for ideas for how to best serve one another's needs and those of the company as a whole. At the end, they pitched their ideas to the CEO, and it resulted in the Brit playbook, which captured the new ways in which they would begin to work together. Now, in our final example, Swedish multinational Ericsson ensures that all working arrangements are grounded in their company values. These include cooperation, collaboration, empathy, and also speaking up. And they do this by organizing jams, during which tens of thousands of employees from around the world share their thoughts on a particular topic. For example, how hybrid ways of working affect company culture, and they do this in virtual conversations. By analyzing the extensive output from these jams, Ericsson's senior leaders are able to develop a more nuanced understanding of the issues and priorities they need to take into account as they develop solutions to workplace challenges, such as designing more effective hybrid work arrangements. The Miro heroes that we heard from earlier echo the importance of involving employees in the process of redesigning the modern workplace. Michelle shared, survey your employees and see what they need. Every company is different. And Annie added, people need to inform what it looks like and how it works, get feedback, and then iterate and adapt. It isn't cookie cutter. The thing that strikes me most about the steps these companies are taking to design human-centric strategies is that they're all committed to trying something new, whether that be setting daily meeting limits, leaning on laughter, or forming focus groups to co-create the future of work. Speaking of innovation, I'm pleased that Catherine Von Jan, the Chief Strategy Officer at Salesforce Innovation, has agreed to join me now to discuss what her organization is doing to reimagine its company culture and employee experience. Hello, Catherine, and welcome to Distribute. It's so great Hi. to have you here joining us. Hi, to start. Paul. Thank you so much. Thank you for being Hello. here. Well, I've got a few questions for you. And to start, I would love for you to explain how the Salesforce innovation function fits into and works with the larger company. Well, thanks. I, I am getting some feedback, so I'm going to go through it and hope we can work it out. I'm just letting you know. Um, OK, we'll hopefully address you. the feedback. Thank you. All right, that's great. It, it's it's solved. Okay, so it's like um, magic. It, first of all, innovation is one of our core values. So everyone at Salesforce is a trailblazer, and no one. Alive and well and thriving at Salesforce, we assess sort of the state of innovation. Um, and look for areas to innovate, um, whether that's employee experience or culture, or just how we work. Um, and we work really across our ELT, whether that's in product or distribution. Um, we are really committed to helping all of our leaders uh, innovate within their teams. Innovation is such a cross-functional process and endeavor. You mentioned how you work with your leadership. Could you share a bit more about how you work with the chief people officer and in particular, how you help ensure that 
the workforce solutions that Salesforce implements are human-centric and not, as our friend Annie would say, cookie cutter. Yeah, I mean, first of all, amazing research and thank you. Um, I, I think uh, first it's most important to listen, listen deeply to our people. And there are a number of ways that we do that. So we work with our chief people officer with our, we don't call it HR, by the way, we call it employee success. So we're working across employee success and the different teams and leaders to listen deeply to our employees' needs, whether that comes from data. So we can look at anonymized data around our healthcare data and which uh, employee assistance programs are being utilized. Um, we can listen to our Slack channels. We have a Slack channel called Airing of Grievances, where people trust the organization enough to go onto those Slack that Slack channel and share the things that are bothering them. Um, and then we can listen and respond to that. Uh, we also have a concierge for employees, and that concierge is really tackling any need across HR, IT, facilities, uh, any kind of question that you have. So when we understand through the data what people are searching for, what they're asking, what they need, then we can respond. Um, and I will say the other piece of that is using real human connection. So our leaders, our team managers are really trained to facilitate dialogue. And we have a number of ethnographic research techniques, but the one I love, I think the most is our learning labs, where we'll identify groups of employees, bring them together, whether that's virtual or in person, and we'll talk about what they're seeing, what they're sensing, where they think things are headed and extrapolate you know, where we can go next. Um, Does that answer your question, Paul? Yeah, that, that completely <laughs> answers the question. There's so many interesting <laughs> things in there. I love the idea of, first of all, the, the grievances Slack channel. Uh, I love the idea of the concierge and also the, the lab. I know, I mean, as organizations get bigger, I see this um, as a leader, even a much smaller organization. Um, it's often hard to hear the voice from the most different parts of an organization. And so putting things like that in place really do help amplify that. And that's really key to designing the right sort of solutions and creating a more magical employee experience. This brings me to, I think I, mm -hmm. go ahead, yeah. Well, I think you raise a really good point there that it's listening isn't enough, right? That that, um, And we see that in our research as well, is mm -hmm. that a lot of organizations are asking and listening, but it's really important to act on what you're hearing. And yeah. the conversations, the the, you know, to empathize with people and to really say, okay, now let's go co-create a solution that will work. That leads to new policies, new programs, new uh, processes. Um, it, you know, my, I think the most important thing that we do is actually follow through with what we hear in terms of um, taking action. Yeah, that's 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 really really powerful. I have next a two part question for you. Are you are you ready? I'll give it to you one piece okay. at a time if that's okay. <laughs> um, so first, beyond the inspiring examples we saw a few minutes ago, what can leaders do to facilitate workplace conditions that do provide um, a more empathetic and magical experience for the employees they serve? Well, I think number one is recognize that values create value and mm -hmm. that uh, values are not something that live on the wall in your or uh, on a poster. There are things that um, you use every day as a litmus test uh, to guide you and to correct course. It's it's how we make decisions. And so um, being really clear on what those values are, what they mean and how they live inside your culture is really important. And, uh, you know, I can just give you an example of yeah. using values, um, two of our values, one yeah. innovation and one trust. Um we had endeavored to use AI to predict attrition, which mm -hmm. you know many organizations would say, "Oh, give me that! I'd like I'd like to be able to predict attrition and then prevent it, uh, preemptively strike and keep that that employee." 
And um, what we found in that research was we were really good. We Our AI was phenomenal. And we could go to a manager and say, hey, I think this person's going to leave. And lo and behold, what happened was those managers would start giving the benefits, the RSUs, the promotions, the attention to those who were kind of thinking of leaving mm -hmm. at the expense of people who were really happy doing great work and um, you know expecting to progress in their career. And the entire program sort of backfired and we had to kill it. And it was a it was a conversation about trust. We were eroding trust mm -hmm. by trying to predict this attrition. And we said, what if instead we flipped it on its head and we could predict mobility and we could re-recruit our people uh, before a headhunter calls or before they even think of leaving? And so, you know, having that dialogue about what's broken and where we need to go next was, you know, partially about the the impact of those decisions and partially it was a conversation about who are we as a company who yeah. are we as leaders what kind of behaviors do we want to cultivate and um and that's values based and ultimately those values help us make great decisions there's so much in that too around innovation i think first of all that mix of bringing technology into the world of people um, but also then running that as an experiment and learning from the experience and then pivoting and shifting that to something that really was right for the organization and move things, move things forward. That's a, a great story. Thank you for sharing that. And that brings me to part two of the question, flipping it a little bit. What can individual employees do to both shape their own experience and to positively impact that of their colleagues? Yeah, um, that, that's a great question. And um, I think, first of all, we believe that the team is the atomic unit of success. So, you know, the, the most important thing is how teams operate, how uh, managers lead, but also peer to peer interactions between employees and recognize that every single employee on the team owns the interaction, owns the relationship that every other employee has with that company. So if we think about employee experience being uh, the relationship between employee and employer, every employee owns employee experience. And so that, that means that I've got to be very thoughtful and listen deeply, ask questions. And what I like to say is that every individual should be a curious anthropologist. Go into any situation humble with a beginner's mind, seek to learn. Um, you know, if you have conflict with your peers or someone in your organization, have a conversation about it and trust each other to have an open dialogue to understand each other and then problem solve together. And I'll say one of the other pieces of that is sort of unlearning old behaviors that aren't working for each other. So I think healthy dialogue around conventional thinking, conventional ways of working and orthodoxies that actually hold your organization back, hold relationships back, um, kind of cause conflict, like evaluate whether or not you need to work that way anymore and find new ways of working that feel healthy and, and really empower everyone on the team to do their best work and support one another. I love the way you put the pieces together of the individual, the team as the atomic unit, and then also all the things that you covered around how that comes together um, for co-creation at the organization level um, to create a more magical experience for employees. Catherine, thank you so much for joining us here today. We really appreciate your being part of this. Well, thanks for having me. And uh, I love Miro, and I'm so grateful to be with all of you today. So thank you and look forward to collaborating some more. Thank you very much. And to all of you joining us around the world, if you enjoyed our conversation, be sure to join Catherine's colleagues, David Berthy and Tiffany Flynn, in just over an hour as they lead a breakout session exploring four distinct yet entirely plausible futures of work. In fact, we have nearly 30 hours of content across 44 sessions for you to explore over the next two days of Distributed. There's plenty of opportunities to learn from and collaborate virtually with Mirrorneers and fellow community members alike. Before I let you go though, let's take a moment to reflect on what we've discussed this morning. 
Hybrid work enables flexibility and freedom while nurturing connection, all of which knowledge workers today say they crave, but hybrid remains a work in progress for now. The good news is that, for many cohorts of workers, our relationships with each other and ourselves have only gotten stronger despite ambiguity within the world of work. Hybrid can be the best of both worlds if leaders continue to work with their employees to strategically and intentionally make it more human. I hope that you leave today feeling empowered and inspired to co-create the future of work that you want to see. Thank you so much for joining us.